This is the 14th in a series of lectures on differential geometry. In this lecture, we'll start by fin finishing off our work on um, going from the microscopic picture of a Lie group and its Lie algebra to the large scale or macroscopic picture of a Lie group. And then we'll, um, we'll use that to, to consider how to, uh, how to uh, qu instruct quotients of manifolds by Lie group actions. The essential ingredient in the microscopic to macroscopic theory will be our study of, from last time of f the theory of foliations. So our first theorem in um, trying to go from the microscopic to the macroscopic picture, suppose we have a G Lie group, and of course it has its Lie algebra, which is this German G. Um, then we have uh, already seen that every subgroup, every Lie subgroup, so sub-manifold and also subgroup um, H and G has um, a Lie algebra. It's script H sitting inside this G um, as a subalgebra, and that's immediate because the brackets are the same, exactly the same operation between the, the left invariant vector fields, um, but the the theorem, the real content of this theorem, is that uh, every um, Lie subalgebra, each containing G, arises from uh, a connected, a unique connected Lie subgroup. Lie subgroup H containing G. So it says that there's a correspondence at least between connected subgroups and subalgebras. Every subgroup has this Lie subalgebra. Its identity component then will also have the same Lie subalgebra, but then you can recover those, those connected Lie subgroups from their Lie subalgebras. We want to be careful that uh, we can't in, in insist that H be an embedded um, subgroup. Uh, it's possible that it doesn't turn out to be embedded. The simplest example is, of course, the torus. We glue together opposite sides on the torus. We know it's a group G, uh, but we could take, as a subgroup, uh, we could take a, a line in the plane starting at the origin and going on with some irrational slope. And as it goes off here, when we quotient the torus together, it comes back on here, goes along the same slope, comes off here, comes back on here, and so on. And if it's a rational slope line, then it will densely uh, cover. So this is our subgroup. Uh, so we, we could see that it would exist according to our theorem because um, the one-dimensional subspace through the origin, uh, every one-dimensional subspace is a, is a Lie subalgebra, um, uh, so, so it's a, which is, is, is easy to check. So any one-dimensional subspace in any uh, Lie algebra is a, is a subalgebra. So we take a one-dimensional subspace that it has to come from a subgroup, and there's the subgroup. But it doesn't have to be an embedded subgroup. It could be quite, uh, quite nasty topologically. So how do we prove this result? Um, the proof is just about foliations. Um, we have H containing G, which is, of course, the tangent space at the identity. Um, what we can do is to construct a plane field uh, simply by letting, at every point G, we define this plane to be left translation by G applied to H, the derivative of left translation applied to H. Um, that'll left translate H, and we know it's a linear isomorphism, so we'll again end up with, with a bunch of uh, a plane field, a bunch of copies of H all over the place. Um, but um, the bracket of the vector fields, the left invariant vector fields, of course, live in this thing. Um, um, so this is left translation. But if you take any left invariant vector field, it's it's going to left translate all over the place, always in the the um, uh, copying itself into these little copies of, of, of the uh, Lie algebra H uh, all over the manifold, so all over our manifold G. Um, so we'll, we'll end up with a picture something like this, but, um, but these uh, brackets are exactly just the, the Lie bracket in the, in the subalgebra copied over by left translations, and so uh, it's bracket closed. And therefore, um, it must have uh, have leaves. Um, so we end up with a with a picture of our group, and then we have some um, left invariant 
vector field, which is or sorry, left invariant um, uh, uh, distribution or plane field all the way around, and um, it has leaves. And so if we pick the identity element and we take the leaf through it, we call that H is the leaf through uh, the identity element. Then we have to prove that that's actually going to be a subgroup. Since the um, the the plane field we've constructed is is left invariant, we end up with a, an elementary observation that its leaves uh, are permuted by left translations. So um, so if we take any any leaf um, of this and we left translate, so we take say through through the identity element the leaf H, and then we take an element G in their group, then uh, the left translate of that will be um, will simply be G H. Um, so because it's invariant under left translation, when you left translate a leaf, you get another leaf. And the what leaf could it be? Well, it's got to be that leaf um, because it's invariant under left translation again by G. And so those are the leaves. Um, they're exactly this. In particular, if we take some, uh, if we take G already belonging to H, um, then um, uh, we find G is in H uh, if and only if. Um, uh, G H is H, and and that means therefore that H is in fact a closed under multiplication. Closed under multiplication, um, and of course it contains one uh, because it was the leaf through one. Um, so we're getting close to having a group, and if we pick uh, some G and H, then of course G H is H, and one H is also H. Um, so. Um, G times something is uh, is one times something is one some H in H and so there are inverses so H is closed under inverse and so H is a is a subgroup H is a subgroup of G but by construction it was a leaf which makes it a submanifold because we said that the leaves were always submanifolds, so it's a it's a subgroup and a submanifold, and that proves the theorem. So that theorem enables us to to actually describe fairly explicitly what the sub uh, the subgroups of various Lie groups are, at least the connected ones. Let's take a simple look at an example. Let's consider the example of um, the group G being the rotations of three dimensional space. Now, what are the subalgebras? We remember that the Lie algebra could be thought of as sometimes written SO3 could be thought of as matrices something like that, but that it might be easier to just think of it as vectors A, B, C with the cross product. So let's just look at that algebra, the algebra of vectors in R3 with cross product. Well, there's an obvious subalgebra, which is zero. A zero subalgebra. Um, then you could take any one-dimensional subspace, and I said that was true for any um, any vector sp uh, any Lie algebra. Every one-dimensional subspace is um, uh, subspaces. Every one-dimensional subspace is in fact um, a, uh, a a subalgebra. So that's a subalgebra. So that's a lot of subalgebras, but um, we know that the subalgebras are essentially the same up to um, if we can rotate one to the other, because we found that uh, we said that the adjoint action uh, would uh, would would act by I automorphisms of the group. So the adjoint action uh, is by automorphisms of the group, and therefore um, uh, these subalgebras. Uh, could be considered to be essentially the same if one can be brought to the other by, for example, an, uh, by an automorphism of the group, in particular by an adjoint action. When we carry out some, uh, take some element G, uh, let's say G naught, and we take every element G to G naught G, uh, G naught inverse, that's our adjoint action. Let's add G naught G, so that's the adjoint action. That acts on, on, on these matrices. These, after all, elements of the group are just three by three rotation matrices. It acts on the elements of the group and therefore acts on the elements of the Lie algebra by the same action. It takes any element of the Lie algebra, let's call this A, equals, um, maps to G naught A 
g naught inverse. How do I know that's the adjoint action? Because the adjoint action is by linear transformations. It's a group of linear transformations. Rotations are linear transformations. And so these are 3 by 3 matrices. And so the action must be the same as for 3 by 3 matrices. And we checked this. We computed out the adjoint representation of matrices. So we know that this is the adjoint representation on the group. And this is on the Lie algebra. But I'll leave you to check that this guy, um, if you take the operation that associates to any such matrix A, the vector, let's call it V, which is ABC, that's a linear isomorphism from, vect from these matrices in, in little so3, this Lie algebra, to this more concrete world of R3 with these vectors. And you can check that when you carry this out, uh, this transformation, uh, the adjoint transformation simply becomes multiplication or rotation of vector v. So, in other words, when I carry out an, an automorphism of the group by this adjoint action, that takes the group to itself. It's an isomorphism of the group, um, and uh, it's in the inverse adjoint action goes back again. So it's an, uh, an automorphism of the group. It's automorphism of the Lie algebra. And it just becomes rotation of vectors. I, I'm not going to prove that bit. I'll leave you to check that bit, that if you take this matrix, turn into this vector by the obvious linear isomorphism given by uh, put, putting any matrix of this form, you know, uniquely expressed A, B, and C into its A, B, and C components, that this capital A goes to V linear isomorphism is actually a joint equivariant, taking the adjoint action to the usual matrix action. That has the effect that all the one-dimensional subalgebras are really the same subalgebra. Essentially, they're all uh, up to isomorphism, all the same subalgebra. So we can we can see that um, as a saying that uh, so up to isomorphism um, inside SO3, we have uh, subalgebras subalgebras of little SO3, which is to say of R3 with the cross product. The subalgebras up to isomorphism are well. There's the 0, 1, and then there's 1, which is the subalgebra generated by E1, the standard basis vector. E1 is, say, 1, 0, 0, and that's up to isomorphism. There's only one of them. In two-dimensional subalgebras, we said there weren't any. If you look for a two-dimensional subalgebra, that would be a two-dimensional subspace of R3, our Lie algebra, is, uh, is, is isomorphic to R3 um, as a vector space, but it has cross product. So we take a, a two-dimensional subalgebra to have two independent vectors. Their cross product is a third vector which points linearly independent of them. And that's not possible. So this is u, this is v, this would be uv, our Lie bracket, which is just cross product of vectors. So if that's what happens, then the cross product is not sitting inside the subalgebra, so it's not a subalgebra. So that means that there aren't any, no subalgebras, no two-dimensional subalgebras. No two-dimensional sub-algebras. And so we've got 0, 1, and then we've got the whole thing. We could have, of course, the whole of R3 as a sub-algebra of itself. It's just the whole thing. And that leads us to the following, that uh, up, to, up to the automorphism of SO3, there's essentially only uh, the connected subgroups uh, are. Um, so there's only the a really we really consider automorphisms to be essentially doing the work for us. There's only uh, the zero-dimensional, or the, the, the one, uh, the uh, identity matrix, if you like. That's that group. And then there's um, the E1 um, um, uh, angular velocity gives us rotations around E1 direction, a circle of rotations. So these are rotations around uh, E1, and then uh, that's a one-dimensional subgroup. And then we have the whole of SO3, all the rotations of three-dimensional space. So there are only really three subgroups up to th this one, up to automorphism. More generally, could just have rotation around any uh, around any uh, unit vector. We make it a unit vector uh, because um, if we made it a non-unit vector, it would just be changing the rate of rotation, but it would be the same group of rotations that would be generated. Okay, so that's a, an example of using this theorem, it, because we really needed the theorem to be sure that we're not missing any other connected subgroups. And of course, there are disconnected subgroups in SO3 as well, but every one of them has to have its identity component be one of these three. And so uh, 
you couldn't have a disconnected subgroup with this as its uh, subgroup of rotations that contained all the rotations. Um, and th so this guy allows us a possibility, maybe there could be some zero dimensional subgroups, some discrete subgroups of SO3, and there could maybe also be some one dimensional subgroups that might that might have this as their identity component, rotation around a particular vector as their identity component. In, in general, in mathematics, when we have a theorem about some kind of object, we usually immediately derive a theorem about some kind of mappings of those kinds of objects, and that's what we're doing here. Um, suppose we have G and H are Lie groups, and I'm not going to assume one's a subgroup for the other, they're just two different Lie groups, and of course they have their usual names for their Lie algebras. Um, and suppose that G is connected. Um, then, um, then we can say that any uh, Lie algebra morphism, so a linear map matching of brackets, um, arises from. I'd like to say it arises from a Lie group morphism. Uh, what I would like to say is G to H, but that's not actually true. We'll see that that's not actually true, but it is true for some G hat. Some uh, G hat over G, a covering group. So it's that's a Lie group, which is also a covering space. Um, so uh, so we have a Lie group morphism, which is a covering map. So let's prove that one. Um, and that so that gives us the the natural generalization of being able to to go from little Lie algebras inside a Lie algebra inside a Lie algebra Lie group to being uh, able to construct Lie groups. Now we're constructing morphisms of Lie groups. So let's make a proof. Um, let's consider that uh, the sum is a Lie algebra. Okay, um, using the obvious brackets. How do you make a sum into a to a Lie algebra? You take a, uh, B, um, bracket, so this one and this one, this one and that one, and you bracket with something, I don't know, C, D, let's say. Uh, you just bracket, I think I did this already, you bracket the first two, uh, sorry, you bracket the first two and, the, what do I want to say? I want to say you bracket the first two, um, and then you bracket the second two. So this is going on in G, this is going on in H. Okay, so that's how you can make a sum into a Lie algebra. Um, and now we take uh, take uh, our we have our Lie algebra morphism, and then um, let's let uh, G hat be defined to be um, uh, so uh, the set of pairs A B such that uh, B is phi of A. So it's the graph of this uh, Lie algebra morphism phi, and of course. Um, g hat to g given by just a b goes to a is an isomorphism. It's obviously a linear isomorphism and it's easy to check it's an isomorphism of Lie algebras. So that way we've put our Lie algebra g into um, into the sum of the two Lie algebras. Okay so g hat is really just a copy of g because it's isomorphic but it sits inside here as the graph of this of this guy. So now what we're going to do is um, we're just going to um, so G, I should say G hat, therefore, by definition, sits inside the sum of the Lie algebras. Um, so, uh, okay, so that makes G hat sit in the sum as a subalgebra, and so um, uh, there must be a connected subgroup let uh, G hat contained in G cross H be the um, associated uh, connected subgroup. Lie subgroup. Uh, so, uh, how do we get that? Well, we said last time if you had a, a Lie subalgebra, we have this a Lie subalgebra inside the inside this Lie algebra. Then you get a Lie subgroup inside the, the associated Lie group. Um, now we we can map uh, G cross H to both G in the obvious way and H in the obvious way by taking a pair. X Y goes to X, X Y goes to Y. So um, the obvious ways, and these are Lie group morphisms. Um, these are Lie group morphisms. So in particular, when we take our G hat, which is a subgroup inside here, it sits in here, we can compose these morphisms, and we get morphisms of this guy to both of those. Um, so we get morphisms. <coughs> 
This one across here gives a morphism g hat to h. This one over this way gives us a g hat to g. Um, now, but the Lie algebra of g hat is, of course, uh, is g hat. Uh, uh, so we get, uh, we recover this guy morphism, and then we have this one is also a morphism of Lie algebras. But this is an isomorphism because it's the one we already had. It's the isomorphism we just wrote down. But since this one's a linear isomorphism, um, it means therefore that this one is a is a covering map, uh, which we proved already. How that if you have a linear isomorphism, the Lie algebra is, comes from a covering map of the Lie groups, at least a covering map onto whichever component it it, it maps to. And since G is connected, it maps to all of G. Okay, so that's the the whole proof. Um, so this has some easy consequences that. Um, if we have a, um, if we have, uh, 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 let's say, suppose G and H are isomorphic Lie algebras, and G and H are associated Lie groups, Lie groups with those Lie algebras, um, uh, and let's suppose they're connected, then. Um, there is some common covering group. So G and H might not be isomorphic, but some cover of G is isomorphic to some cover of H. There is some covering group in common. And the way we prove that is just that we have our, our isomorphism of Lie algebras. And so we apply the result, previous result to that, and it gives us some cover of G mapping to H, and then similarly some cover of H mapping to G. Um, and we can uh, put those without too much effort and put those together and get a uh, that the they get an isomorphism of the coverings. So th this leads us to the idea that we've more or less understood everything about Lie groups or a lot of them, anything, a lot of things about Lie groups just by understanding their Lie algebras. An enormous amount is is known by understanding the Lie algebra. So we can uh, we could wonder if maybe we could try and classify uh, uh, connected Lie groups. Okay, but we can't, the result, previous result was as you don't get them on the nose, you get them up to covering. So up to covering. Now there's always a, a, a universal covering, which is the simply connected one. So we might try and classify simply connected and connected Lie groups. Um, so that's exactly the same question. You want to classify the Lie groups well, maybe not all the Lie groups, maybe just the connected ones. And the pre previous result says, well, you could only do it up to covering. Um, but that means you could do the simply connected ones. And that's the same thing by the previous result as classifying Lie algebras. Up to isomorphism of Lie algebras. So that's the, the problem we run into. And you can um, you know, of course, that a Lie algebra simply has to be some kind of bracket operation which has to uh, have some, it's bilinear, on, it's, it lives on some vector space, it's a bilinear uh, mapping, anti-symmetric. And then it has the horrible Jacobi identity, which we wrote out before, which we'll try, to, we'll try to ignore as much as possible. But we do find then that, that uh, uh, we could in principle reduce this to a linear algebra problem, find all the bilinear um, anti-symmetric bracket operations that satisfy Jacobi identity. And so this is some some horrible nonlinear identity on this bracket thing. Um, so in principle, this sounds possible, but it turns out that after fairly low dimensions, so you can do it in dimensions of 0, 1, 2, without too much effort. Dimension 3 is done in somewhere in the lecture notes. Um, in dimensions 4, 5, and 6, you can more or less do it, but it gets to be uh, too complicated to work with. I believe Lee did 4, maybe 5. And I know some people have tried to do some work on these uh, problems in these dimensions, but it uh, it gets very, very messy and complicated. I think it might be known up to about dimension six. Luckily, though, just as we found that, um, well, we said that Lie groups usually don't have hugely complicated collections of components. They usually don't have um, hugely complicated uh, structure. Uh, most often, uh, Lie groups, unless they arise in very low dimensions, typically are not uh, sort of, uh, you know, very complicated. Uh, their their structure tends to be fairly straightforward. So uh, they don't tend to come up in, in the very, very complicated ones in these classifications. So uh, luckily for us, it's, it's practical to study Lie groups without having to classify all of them. You can just work with the ones that arise in most important circumstances in, in mathematics, physics, chemistry, engineering, and so on.
So once, once we have some idea that this helps us to understand more or less how to classify lead groups, we could a try to understand, can we classify their actions, or at least can we detect if we've got an action? Um, so we want to sort of build up actions. Suppose that, uh, that uh, G, uh, some Lie algebra, is the Lie algebra of some uh, let's say of some connected, simply connected Lie group. And uh, we're assuming that because it helps us to prove the following result, but Addo's theorem uh, says this is always the case. Every Lie algebra is in fact such a thing. We said by Addo we could actually prove that. Addo had a theorem about Lie algebras arising, uh, how, they, how they show up as linear uh, Lie algebras. Uh, algebras of matrices, the algebras of matrices, and we said we, from that we could prove this result. So it is, in fact, this. There isn't really an assumption going on there. It's just that it's a Lie algebra. Um, but we're not going to prove that, so we'll just use this assumption to avoid having to prove that fact, and having to prove a Dose theorem. Um, then we have the following uh, Lie algebra action. Um, of G arises from a Lie group action if and only if um, all uh, vector fields, vector fields of the action, of the Lie algebra action, are complete. And we did see, we looked, so before we give any kind of proof. Remember that we looked at the example. We did look at the example of SL2R and it acted on RP1 as our, our sorry, RP1 as our manifold. Um, we looked at that example and when we looked at that example we found that uh, the real li number line sat inside there um, and we could have a um, an action. Uh, we have this action on here then it gives rise, of course, to a Lie algebra action of vector fields. And we wrote down explicitly what the vector fields were. They, they were defined on R, but they weren't complete on R because to, to make them complete, you have to include that pointed infinity that, uh, that compactifies R into RP1. So, uh, so this was really an example of a Lie algebra action where the vector fields in the action really are incomplete on R, but they become complete when you compactify and make it into RP1. Okay, so uh, so we can see why you we need completeness because this Lie algebra action on R is a Lie algebra action perfectly perfectly fine, but it but it has incomplete vector fields, so it can't be coming from a Lie group action. But we found that if we added just the right point of infinity, uh, we could actually extend it to become complete, and then it came from a Lie group action. Okay, let's see how we prove this result about constructing uh, group actions out of Lie algebra actions. Um, so, uh, so what we do is we take a Lie algebra action, which associates to anything in our Lie algebra, uh, some uh, vector field which we've used this notation for, on some manifold M. Now, um, this isn't going to work directly on M, but what I can do is I can define an action. Let's call this A M to say that it's a vector field on M. And there's also an A G on G. That was our right invariant vector field. I'll use this notation. Uh, the right invariant vector field are right like this, and therefore on uh, on G cross M, I can define a new vector field, creating a new Lie algebra action, which is defined to be a G on G plus a M on M. So I have a new Lie algebra action, which is this action, and the bracket works out because of the way the the way that these. Uh, these guys have their brackets working out. So this is a Lie algebra action. And um, moreover, the really reason you're introducing this, rather than working directly with the action I was given, is that these are actually linear independent. Those are linear independent uh, for, li for some basis of, 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 the, uh, of, of, of the Lie algebra. If I take a basis of, from the Lie algebra here, um, these vector fields may, may behave very strangely. They may not longer be a basis. There may be points where they all vanish or something like that. Um, but uh, these vector fields are linear dependent at every point, and therefore these ones are. So that's the reason why I want to throw in a copy 
of the group attach it to the manifold here by making the product. And that way I can make sure this is, a, this is not just an action, but an action by linear dependent vector fields. And as a consequence, um, these guys, um, uh, the set of these vector fields uh, uh, form a bracket closed, they span a bracket closed, um, uh, um, a bracket closed plane field. They span a bracket closed plane field on G cross M, which they wouldn't do on M because they wouldn't be wouldn't be a plane field because it would change dimensions at various points. So we've cheated by putting that G cross factor in there, and that gives us um, a nice uh, plane field to which we can apply the Frobenius theorem. Um, so uh, uh, there has to be a, a leaf of the associated foliation. So this is a foliation through some point, let's say 1m0, um, and let's call it g prime uh, is that name of that leaf. And then we have a, um, an obvious map that's g prime uh, maps to g by taking a gm maps to g. Uh, so the obvious map. Um, and uh, we can um, we can always assume that without loss of generality, we said that there was a connected, simply connected group G. Um, so we could take G to be connected and simply connected. Um, but this map is then going to be a Lie algebra isomorphism. Um, so it's a covering map. This map is going to induce on Lie algebras just the the Lie algebra um, the just this. Uh, map dropping this component, so it's going to produce exactly the right invariant vector fields back again. When you drop M, you drop that component, you get exactly that component. And so when you do this, you get uh, an isomorphism of Lie algebras and therefore a covering map. And so this is a covering map, but G was connected and simply connected, and so G, and G prime to G is a covering. So from topology, you know, or you, if you don't know, I'll tell you that that means therefore it's 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 a it's a, a homeomorphism, and therefore it's actually a diffeomorphism. Um, so it, so in fact, it, and and therefore it's an isomorphism of Lie groups because it's also a group morphism. Um, so you get this wonderful um, isomorphism. So it is G. So G prime is isomorphic to G. Um, and then you get an action. Okay, so how do you get an action? Um, we have to make it act on the manifold. Well, we started um, at the point. We, we made it the leaf. G prime was the leaf uh, through uh, the point 1 and m naught for some m naught. Now, how do we um, then um, um, how do we then make a make an action? Um, it, it's a leaf, so it's invariant to the flows. But what are the flows? of our vector fields, of our vector fields A. Um, the flows are just e to the ta uh, times, well, let's say for any point, we start with a point uh, G and M, uh, then we flow uh, to e to the ta G, e to the ta M um, for our action. Uh, and, uh, or let's say if we start at a point um, I want to say if I've started a point, um, uh, uh, let's see, I want to say if I started a point, let's see, so we have this diffeomorphism, which is, um, uh, so we had, so we said a diffeomorphism, uh, which was uh, given by taking um, uh, G and G M naught goes to, uh, some g. Um, so um, so this has to be a, 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 an isomorphism of groups, and so this has to actually be the same g. Um, and so we've got, um, uh, because the morphism had to be applied here, but it's the, it's the identity morphism. So we can assume it's the identity, so we assume that is g. And therefore, um, we can say now apply that to the flow, which is what I should have done. Um, so, so we've got our isomorphism of groups has to look like this, and so um, all right, so that has to be a diffeomorphism. Um, and so what we've got is uh, we've got these points that look like this, which are in the 
in this G um, prime. And then um, uh, the flows uh, then uh, apply to these guys. Um, and uh, uh, this is the flow applied to this guy. Um, but that tells me, therefore, that this this guy has to, therefore, satisfy that e to the t a uh, g m naught has to be, um, that is the flow of my vector field applied to this guy has to be e to the t a g m naught. Um, so uh, that's from the fact that this guy has to still map to the to to this to the corresponding point in G. Um, and you repeat this for any uh, finite product of exponentials, and what you find is finally that um, uh, that uh, uh, G then is acting on M by um, after doing finitely many product exponentials, G is acting on M. By, uh, by by the, the, the Lie group action because we're going to get it to satisfy the required uh, property of the parenthesizing that we need to get a Lie group action. Okay, so um, so that constructs out of a, a Lie group action out of a out of a Lie algebra action. And as I think I said before, we should really try to avoid uh, Lie groups and use Lie algebras as much as we can because they are uh, much simpler objects. They're, after all, just vector spaces with some kind of bracket of them. They're much more comfortable to work with, and they tend to show up on manifolds as being vector fields, which we like. Uh, they're much easier to understand somehow than, than Lie groups. So now, now we're, we're at, at the point where we can begin to worry about the, the, the really difficult problem of, of trying to understand quotients. Um, so we have some Lie group and it acts in some manifold M and we can simply define M mod G defined to be uh, the quotient space. So that means, in other words, where we let any point M be equivalent to M G M for any M in M in uh, G and G. It has a quotient topology, but in general it's usually not a uh, vector space. Sometimes it's written as mg, but it's also, uh, especially if I'm acting on the left, uh, it's more uh, often better to write it as g mod m, and that's I think that's the way I'd prefer to write it. Often written this way, often written this way. This is preferable if it's actually a, a quotient by a by a, a left action. We'll, we'll always also use the notation that if uh, we pick a point m naught and m, then we'll write g m naught as the stabilizer. G stabilizer of stabilizer of M naught, and that means by definition the set of G and G, which fixes M naught. So the stabilizer of point. So we, we want to look at very very simple examples. Um, already we can see there's quite a lot there. Uh, if you take the sphere and you rotate it, not by all possible rotations, but just by the ones that fix the the vertical axis, um, then obviously the quotient is given by how high up you are. Um, so the south pole maps to minus one, let's say the north pole maps to plus one um, by how high it is. And every uh, every other point, once you trace out this rotation this by this circle, you can say that it can be taken to any point that's at the same height. And so the equivalence class can be represented as how high the point is. So we take each point, say x, y, z in the sphere, and we map it to its z value in the interval from minus 1 to 1. And uh, so our group here is not all of SO3. Our group here is, we could say, SO2 acting on the xy plane and fixing, um, rotating the x and y, and then fixing the z. Um, so it rotates these two variables and leaves that one alone. And that way it acts on three-dimensional space, but it acts trivially on the z component. So z is an invariant, and that's why it becomes a function on the quotient space. But it is the quotient space. The quotient space is just the points from minus 1 to 1, inclusive, right? So we can see that, in fact, um, uh, S2 quotiented by this action of SO2 is exactly as a topological space, the interval from minus 1 
to 1. Now, to make sure it's exactly right, you'd have to be a bit careful. You use the fact that this is compact and um, and Hausdorff, and this is Hausdorff, so there, there is a bit of work to be done topologically to make sure this works. We won't need to worry about it, but you can certainly see this isn't a manifold. Right? It's not a manifold because it's got these boundary points to it, uh, which, which are not interior points and where it, where it doesn't look homeomorphic to the interior. So that's an example already where you take a smooth manifold and a very simple smooth action, and the quotient space is not a smooth manifold. So um, some obvious problems then. Um, we want the quotient to be a manifold. That didn't work. Um, there'll be worse quotients, though, where the quotient isn't even Hausdorff. Let's see if we can understand that a little bit better. So a closed action um, is one uh, where the quotient uh, where um, the quotient is Hausdorff. Remember, that means you can house off points in the quotient. Um, so that means so that that's in the quotient. So that means in the original space you have some orbits of the group, and what you can do is to invariantly house them off, right? By not just by open sets, but by invariant open sets, because the open sets down here correspond to invariant open sets up here, and so you want to be able to somehow uh, house off up here by not just by open sets, but by invariant open sets to get a Hausdorff quotient space. So that's what we need to be able to do, and that's what a closed action looks like somehow. So um, so what's a, what's an example where we might have trouble with the Hausdorff uh, behavior? Um, one simple example um, is to take, uh, we take a, uh, a rotation vector field, um, which ha does have a nice Hausdorff quotient, um, so a vector field that rotates the plane, given by, let's say, y of x and y. It's a rotation field we've already written down, x d d y minus uh, y d d x. And then, um, then we can multiply it by a function. Um, let's take a function, a very simple example of a function, let's say capital X of x and y is 1 minus x squared minus y squared times capital Y of x and y. So it's exactly the same guy, except we slow it down where x squared and y squared are close to 1. In other words, where we're close to the unit circle. Uh, but uh, by a factor which is, let's say, which is positive inside and, and negative outside. So we now have the unit circle, and at every point of the unit circle, this capital X is zero. So all of those are fixed points. Inside, it's still rotating. If I got the direction of rotation, well, I won't worry about it, but maybe I've got the direction of rotation correct. But it becomes very, very slow as you get close to the, to the circle. It gets a little bit faster in the middle. And then at the center, it's a slow again. It's zero. Um, still zero, where this guy was zero. Um, but uh, as you go outside, it's actually changing direction slightly. Okay, so what's the quotient space? Well, in the quotient space, each of these is a point, and so it's actually rather bad. Um, so the orbits are closed. Why are they closed? Because the orbits outside are still circles. It's more, more slowly moving around, but it's moving still around circles. On the inside, the orbits are also circles. It's still going around in circles, uh, except for that orbit, which is a point. But uh, these orbits aren't, aren't circles. The orbits through these, these fixed points, they're just points. And so you have points there and circles there. Um, uh, and, and then you have a real problem that the quotient is not Hausdorff, because when you're on this guy, you get a, a quotient, which is a, you get it's just that single point as your orbit. And so the space of orbits, the quotient space, so m here is, of course, the plane. Uh, um, and G, I should say, is the flow of uh, the flow of X, the vector field X. We allow it to move the points of the plane, and so we allow the group of transformations, which is this flow of X, which is after all just R. Um, so G is R um, acting by time T flow, right? So it's just acting by um, by taking, let's say, a time, and then a vector X and Y, and the action is defined to be. Uh, flow along the vector field x through the point x and y. Um, so that's our that's our definition for a group. It's the, the just the, the real numbers. Now when we're uh, outside here, we, our quotient are circles. We're inside here, the quotient are circles. But um, but these points are uh, are not um, going to produce circles. They're going to produce individual points. Um, and I'll leave you to check that even though the orbits are closed, uh, the quotient space 
M mod G, or as I said before, we should probably be writing it the G mod M, um, whichever one, you, whatever notation we decide to take, is um, is not closed. Is sorry, is not Hausdorff. It's not Hausdorff, um, even though the orbits are closed. Okay, so that's a, an important example because it's an example in which we had closed orbits, but how, not Hausdorff. So. Um, so that's a bit surprising because because typically the examples we find of non-Hausdorff quotients usually come from having non-closed orbits. Let's take a look at that. Um, this is an example that's very similar, but we're basically going to use um, hyperbolas instead of circles. Um, a very simple example and, and a very important example um, uh, where we're going to just uh, take, a again, a vector field. Um, well, let's not do it. Let's do it as an actual group action. Let's try, uh, so uh, as usually, let k be r, c, or h, the quaternions. And then we're going to let g be k cross. Um, uh, the non-zero, which of course, remember, is k minus zero, the non-zero elements acting as a group under multiplication. And uh, then they're going to act on the, uh, the manifold is going to be the plane uh, over those kinds of numbers. So real plane or two complex variable plane or two um, quaternion variable plane, and the action is going to be we take t in g and we take a point x, y in m, think of the real case for simplicity, and just map it to, well, t times x, y is going to be defined to be the action of the group. This is defining the group action. Action of group on point is defined to be uh, multiply scale uh, x variable by quantity t, but scale y variable by quantity t to the minus 1. Um, so different scale factors. What does that look like? Uh, geometrically, it's very easy to draw. Uh, what you do is you have an xy plane. We'll, of course, draw only the real case, but there are cases over the others. Uh, if you take a point, you get to rescale uh, down its x and up its y, so the product remains the same. If you multiply those two, you don't change the product. So it stays on x, y equal to some constant. As you move with the variable t like this, you're fixing the product of x and y. You know that you're fixing the hyperbola and stays on. So it stays in this hyperbola, and the hyperbolas get very steep as we go in toward the corner, and they appro approach the corner. And um, and then, of course, there's another orbit, which is this guy here, this, um, this guy with the origin deleted. Uh, this horizontal axis with the origin deleted is one is also an orbit. The vertical axis with the origin deleted is an orbit. By the way, this isn't really an orbit because you could also multiply t being negative. Um, you could multiply it by negative t, and you go over to this guy. So an orbit will consist of um, uh, two. Um, uh, let's see. I want to draw them so they look the same. So I'm going to have a hyperbola. A complete hyperbola. So it's gonna, not just going to be one sheet. There's one sheet here, but the same orbit. Uh, has points over here, because the group action enables you to multiply by by t being minus one, which take you from here to here. Um, so the group orbit consists of two uh, pieces, and over the real numbers, it's disconnected. Um, and then um, we get and we get similar hyperbolas over here and over here. So our orbits consist of hyperbolas, uh, like these thread ones. And then there's another, as I said, another type of orbit, which is the uh, it's hard to draw in the color, but along the the non-zero real axis is another orbit. The non-zero um, uh, y-axis, vertical axis, is also an orbit. And then we have a single orbit at the origin. Um, so uh, so we get those various orbits. Maybe I should draw in some color. Uh, OK, well, the vertical axis is another orbit. So I have one orbit here, one orbit here, one orbit here, and then these orbits here. Now, um, uh, so we said that um, that um, uh, x, y is constant is, is an invariant uh, as we move along. The product of x times y is, 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 a, is a constant. So it's a function. We can say that uh, x, y is a function uh, to k on, there, on this guy. and um, and it drops to the quotient. It actually is defined on the quotient space. When it's based in abstract topological space, it does have a well-defined function, x, y. Um, but it's a continuous function, too, um, because it's continuous here and invariant becomes defined on the quotient. But it's not enough. Um, it turns out the quotient space is not Hausdorff. Why is it not Hausdorff? Because uh, you can't house off the orbit of this guy from the orbit of this guy. 
Uh, and in fact, if you take an open set around a point and, and some invariant open set around this guy, it's going to contain lots of other things too. So it's um, it's not Hausdorff. I'll leave you to check it, that this is not Hausdorff. Um, So non-Hausdorff uh, group actions are quite bad. In fact, it's not even closed. It's worse than not Hausdorff. It's not a closed group action because there are non-closed orbits. So I'll let you check that. Um, so that's an, an interesting example of constructing uh, a group action where the quotient is really badly behaved, even though the group action is extremely elementary. So we want to find a, a simple trick for testing to see if we're going to end up with a Hausdorff quotient. Um, and um, the first uh, the part of the trick is to know the, the incidence relation. Let define R to be, when we have a group action, uh, the set of uh, pairs M, uh, GM in M cross M such that M's in M and G's in G. So if our group action and we construct this is called the incidence correspondence or something like that. Correspondence. Um, so that's the object we want to think about, and um, and we have the following helpful theorem: that the incidence correspondence is closed as a subset of M cross M, if and only if uh, the quotient space is Hausdorff. Oh, sorry, G mod M is Hausdorff. So that's a useful result that we can we can apply. Uh, the proof is very easy. Um, so um, we want to look at in M cross M. Uh, and we know that the topology is generated by open sets of which are the form products of open sets in each. Um, so all right, so it's uh, so it's pro product open sets. Now um, let's define an open set. I, I shouldn't use the letter U because I'm going to use U for the next thing, which is not the same U. Uh, let's let U be M cross M minus R. Um, so then we can say R is closed uh, exactly when um, for any points M not M1 in M that they should live outside of uh, of this guy if um, for all M not and M1 if uh, they uh, live in U then um, there exists some product open set product um, contained in U um, with M naught and M1 in the product. So M naught's in U naught, M1's in U1. Um, so, uh, but that's exactly saying M naught is in U naught, M1 is in U1, right? Um, so, uh, so uh, we want to ask whether or not they're either they're in the same g orbit, um, but being in the same g orbit would make the, make the, uh, m one be uh, be exactly m one is g m not. In other words, being in R. So we can say that um, so m not and m one are um, uh, not in m are not in the same uh, g orbit. That's to say, they're not in in our in our uh, incidence correspondence R, if and only if, let's see, um, uh, there exists uh, U naught U1 open subsets of M with M naught in U naught, M1 in U1, um, uh, and um, and uh, U naught cross U1 it doesn't intersect R, sorry, it doesn't intersect R, it's empty. So, uh, so, um, uh, so we can say that um, um, for all M in U naught, GM is not in U1. Okay, so that means exactly that uh, G U naught and G U1 are, are going to house, are invariant houses, um, invariant houses. And so that's our picture that uh, you need to have somehow these invariant houses um, around the orbits. And that's exactly what we've constructed here. Okay, so... Um
So that tells us a, a criterion for deciding if the quotient is Hausdorff, which we can usually calculate more easily. For example, if you take any compact Lie group, you always get a Hausdorff quotient because you always get a closed incidence correspondence, and that's just a trivial application of, of, of the compactness. Um, okay, so we want to now think about when can we actually get a nice uh, manifold as the quotient. So, uh, so this is the big theorem, much more important than the last one. So if a Lie group G acting smoothly on a manifold M, um, and then we'll let m bar be defined to be the quotient, um, the quotient topology. Then we have this r, our incidence correspondence in m cross m, and uh, we want to say the following is a closed, it's a closed embedded submanifold. So we said closed was equivalent to, to being a Hausdorff quotient. This is better, closed embedded submanifold, uh, if and only if um, uh, m to m bar is a smooth submersion. of manifolds um, for some for some uh, and it will turn out in fact to be unique um, uh, smooth structure on m bar. Okay, so that's the idea. If you can make this guy be a closed embedded submanifold, you have to check embedded and closed. Then, in fact, you get a, a nice quotient manifold. So that's uh, that reduces the problem of, of of trying to understand quotient manifolds to the problem of trying to understand uh, whether or not something is closed and embedded, um, which is essentially kind of some kind of implicit function type of problem like we've seen previously. Okay, let's see if we can do the proof. Um, so uh, so let's suppose that R is closed as a closed embedded uh, uh, submanifold of um, M cross M. The incidence correspondence is an M closed embedded submanifold. Um, we know therefore that the quotient space is, uh, which we called M bar, is Hausdorff. We've checked that already. Um, so in particular, the orbits are, are closed subsets because they're pre-images of the points in the Hausdorff space under the quotient map. Um, now we can look at the, at the permutation, um, P, Q uh, in M cross M goes to Q, P in M cross M. And because, in fact, because this is a group um, action, this takes R to R. This operation takes R to R because if, if P and Q are in the same orbit, then Q and P are in the same orbit. Let's write down um, pi 1 to be the map that on a pair PQ gives me P and pi 2 on PQ gives me Q. Um, so uh, just uh, for notation for our maps. Now if we, if we were to fix some particular um, point in some particular element of the group, we could look at um, at the map which takes a point in the manifold and maps it up to uh, the point and g naught times the point, which is in the incidence correspondence because the incidence correspondence consists of points in the same orbit as one another. Um, and then we could map that to back to um, to p again by our map pi one. This map is 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 obviously injective. In fact, it's a it's a smooth um, immersion. This map is uh, is a submersion on the manifold. But the composition is the identity map, and therefore uh, pi one uh, must be a full rank. When you differentiate the the composition, you get the identity. So when you differentiate this guy, you have to have an uh, you have to have an, uh, an on two linear map. Uh, pi one is a submersion. So how, how do you know a submersion? You know by, by differentiating, you find the derivative is onto. But the derivative of this map has to compose the derivative of this map to get a, an onto map. And so it must itself be onto. By permutation, uh, by this permutation here, the same is true since R is permutation invariant. Pi 2 must also be um, a submersion. Okay, so, um, so we've got both of them to be submersions. Now we know by the implicit function theorem that the fibers of submersions are are smooth manifolds. So we know that if we let R P be defined to be pi one inverse of P contained in R, um, 
then, uh, or let's say pi 1 of p inverse, maybe intersect r is probably a better way to put it, um, uh, then we know that that's a, that's a submanifold. Um, it's an embedded submanifold of r. Um, since pi 1 comma pi 2 is the identity mapping on m cross m, uh, we know that um, we know that uh, the kernel of pi 1 prime intersecting the kernel of pi 2 prime is 0. And that therefore tells us that pi 2 has to take rp, which is the kernel of pi 1, uh, to m uh, by an injective immersion. Because it can't overlap its kernel with anything in here. And this guy, is, as tangent space, is exactly given by the kernel of this guy. Um, these are this, that's the tangent space of this guy and then uh, these can't overlap, so we get uh, that this is an injective immersion. We can write that Rp, um, this submanifold we constructed, this is pi inverse of P contained in R, um, is therefore the set of pairs P and Gp. Since R consists just of the orbit, this is the orbit through P. Um, it's just, oh, sorry, R consists of, of the unions of the orbits. This is the orbit through P, so it's all these guys. G and G. Um, so it's exactly P crossed with the orbit of G through P. And it's embedded. Um, we said RP was an embedded submanifold. And so the orbits are, in fact, embedded submanifolds. Orbits, is, orbits are embedded uh, in M. They're embedded submanifolds. And because the quotient was Hausdorff, they're actually closed as well. We know that uh, when you have a Hausdorff space, uh, the the preimage of any point is is clo is a is closed. Um, the points are closed, so the preimages are closed. So that gives us that these guys are actually closed embedded submanifolds. Since these R P are actually um, fibers, are uh, pi one inverse of P's uh, fibers um, of some submersion. Well, R intersect R of some some submersion. Uh, sorry, pi one on R went to M. Um, so they were the fibers of a submersion. Sorry, that's not very clearly written. Um, they, uh, they're they the fibers of a submersion. Um, so it, it follows that um, uh, their tangent spaces very smoothly. Um, the tangent spaces um, of the RP very smoothly. In fact, they form the leaves of a foliation, as we saw before. Um, so you can calculate something about what those tangent spaces are. Um, tangent space at point, well, let's pick a point. Let's say, let's pick a point. R is um, P, uh, GP in, in the incidence correspondence. Incidence correspondence consists of points in the same orbit, so P, GP. Um, uh, then, um, uh, then the tangent space at that point of that manifold RP is exactly uh, zero because it has to because it comes from the projection RP is from the inverse of the projection uh, by that guy RP and then the tangent space to the orbit because you can move this guy along the orbit but that guy has to remain fixed um, so uh, we can write the same point R as being uh, G inverse Q and Q and so we can write its tangent space um, and R is zero plus uh, tangent space G Q G Q, um, and it varies. Uh, sorry, varies um, smoothly with Q. By the smoothness of that variation, these uh, tangent spaces to the orbits. Um, very smoothly, smoothly on the underlying manifold M because they really only depend on the point Q in the underlying manifold M. And so they form a smooth uh, plane field. Um, down on M. But the tangent spaces are the tangent spaces of the orbits. They vary smoothly forming a plane field, but then the orbits themselves are tangent to that plane field by definition. It's just their tangent spaces. And so they form integral manifolds. And so the G orbits are 
uh, integral manifolds of a plane field on M. Um, so we've constructed something, we've got some kind of picture that they're actually, um, they're all the same dimension and they're all uh, just stacked up with each other in a nice way. Okay, so if we take a point, um, let's take a point R naught and write it as um, P naught and G naught, P naught in R. Then we have linear surjections, which are pi 1 prime at R naught and pi 2 prime uh, at R naught. And because uh, they have uh, kernels of uh, both of the same dimension, because we said we could permute the ordering, uh, and R was invariant under it, they have the kernels of the same dimension. And they're both surjective, so their dimension, the dimension of that thing is dimension of R minus dimension of M. The generic linear subspace then, so there are two subspaces of the same dimension, we pick the generic linear subspace which is of complementary dimension, it'll be complementary to both. Um, so we could take the generic, um, uh, the generically chosen embedded submanifold. So some submanifold whose tangent space is complementary to this one, but also to that one at one point, and then nearby it will also be uh, ten, it will also have that complementarity at all nearby points, and so uh, so we can make sure that um, uh, pi one uh, generic embedded submanifold say S contained in um, in R um, uh, will um, with dimension S chosen. Um, uh, and a tangent space chosen at one point, so that it's complementary to uh, to pi one uh, prime and pi two prime. Okay, so we've chosen this submanifold, and therefore um, we get that um, pi one and pi two uh, restricted. Let's say pi one restricted to S and pi two restricted to S are both um, uh, are both going to be immersions. Uh, at least if we make S small enough, because we chose it so that its tangent space wouldn't touch either of those tangent spaces, either of those spaces, the kernels of those two. And so these become immersions on it, they're injective on it, uh, they're objective differentials. And so we can, we can make S smaller um, if we need to, to arrange that they're embeddings. So we have these embeddings. Um, so now we have uh, embeddings of S uh, to M, pi 1 and pi 2 are two different embeddings, pi restricted to S are two different embeddings, and this guy's sitting inside, inside R. The fact that these are embeddings that, that, that means that, in fact, that uh, exactly that the pre-images of points of M will only intersect once, uh, and so, um, so pi uh, of, uh, pi 1, pi 2 injective means that S intersects these RPs once only uh, at most. And so that means that S is a, is a local section um, of, the, across of the foliation of the foliation. So it's a local section of the foliation and that uh, imp uh, implies that the foliation is a submersion. Um, by pre by our results on foliations, uh, the foliation is a submersion. And that's our, our foliation had leaves given by our orbits, so that's exactly a, a submersion to the space of orbits. That's our, uh, our submersion. It has to be, uh, uh, the, the space of leaves is exactly the space of orbits. Uh, and that gives us our, our submersion. Okay, so um, the fibers, uh, well, maybe we should be more precise. It's not quite this, it's almost this. Um, the precise statement is it's this foliation is a submersion. It's, of course, possible that maybe the orbits aren't connected. And so the foliation has, has quotient space given by uh, a, a submersion to the components. So let's be more precise about that. Um, so, um, so we can say, so M maps to the space of components of orbits. We have to actually separate out, if the orbit is disconnected, we have to separate into two components. 
um, is a submersion. Okay, so we've got, got close, but not quite there. Um, so this space of components, let's call this N. And so what we have is we have a map M to N, which is a submersion of manifolds. And then we have N to M bar. And this guy is the problem. It's, it's getting, it's taking the many components, this, this guy in this two component um, orbit becomes squished down into two different points in N. Um, but those two different points then map to a single point in a single point in M bar. So that's the worry we have to deal with at this point. But it, it's it's already, we know that, that we have these local sections. We said we had local sections, um, S, uh, and that it made sure that, that in fact, um, they, they're carried to M bar by, uh, by, um, by local homeomorphism. And they lived upstairs. Uh, so the, in, in, in M, for example, so they, um, they actually um, make sure that the, the, they map to, by the local homeomorphism means we can lift this guy um, to be more precise. If we, have, um, if we have these two points that are in the same orbit of the group action, but different components of that orbit, they represent different po points in N, um, but, um, but they're in the same G orbit. Now the group action will smoothly move local sections around to all points of each g orbit. So this local section here can be sli can slide over along the group action to produce a local section anywhere else, even at other components of the group action. Um, and when you put that into the quotient, the quotient by the group action, this will of course be the same uh, mapping. It'll map to the exactly the same thing. Um, so the resulting smooth charts are, are identified with one another. And the resulting uh, charts are uh, uh, in, on uh, the space N are uh, G invariant. They're going to be invariant charts, and so uh, so the smooth structure descends. descends to one on M bar um, because the charts are exactly the same mappings but because after all they're invariant under the group action. Um, so that'll give us the charts downstairs and it'll make sure then that the mapping, uh, of course because they're exactly the same charts upstairs and downstairs then M to M bar is going to be uh, is going to be a local diffeomorphism. Uh, so finally we have a picture of uh, this guy as a submersion um, and this guy is a local diffeomorphism using exactly the same charts. And so this guy is a submersion as well. But the reverse direction is, 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 is easier. I've only done one direction of the proof, which is quite long. The other, the other direction is very short, so I'll, I'll leave you to think about that. Um, but we can con construct simple examples of group actions using this and make sure that they actually quotient. Maybe I'll leave those examples till next time because we are getting a little bit over time here. Um, so next time we'll think about homogeneous spaces of Lie groups and some of the basic results we can derive from them from this uh, very difficult theorem about quotients.